of the world. Which brings me to our message today, which I, I thought would be appropriate because um, we need to know why we must support missions. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, why we must support missions. And I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 to begin with, but we'll be looking at a number of verses. Why we must support missions. In, in my years as a um, believer, I've been a part of several different churches, and each of them had their own missionary uh, support system or, or activities. I, I don't think uh, everybody does it the same way, which is okay. Uh, everybody does it uh, supporting missions different ways. You know, I've also come to learn that not all churches support missionaries. Not all churches do. Uh, we should. In fact, I believe we must as a Christian church. And, and so today, allow me, I'm just going to speak to us as a body why you and I must be a part of missionary support, missionary activity. We must be a outreach and missions-minded congregation. In Acts chapter 1, you know what's happening um, the Lord has been crucified, resurrected, appearing to his disciples. And in Acts chapter 1, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, Luke is speaking to Theophilus and saying, Till the day that he was taken up after he, verse 2, through the Holy Ghost gave commandments unto the apostles that he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive after his passion, that is, after his suffering and death and crucifixion, he showed himself alive. He was resurrected by many infallible proofs being seen of them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he suggested to them, he commanded them, that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of me, heard from me, that John baptized with water, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons that the Father has put in his own power. But here's what you do need to know. You shall receive power. Power. You will receive power. Power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Power for victorious living. Power to be a consistent Christian witness. You can't be a consistent Christian witness if you don't live a consistent Christian life. And the Holy Spirit will enable you to live a consistent Christian life. After the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you receive power. And listen, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You will be my witnesses, both. Uh, the word both there can be translated also or even. You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth the uttermost parts of the earth, the farthest regions of the world, you'll be witnesses, you'll bear my testimony, you'll preach my message, my gospel. You know, through, through the course of the past year, we've had uh, a number of missionaries come and share with us about what the Lord is doing in their part of the world or through their ministry uh, some of these missionaries labor overseas. Some of the missions and ministries we support are, uh, are more uh, national or local, you know, like Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge, while we support the local branches, they're all over Louisiana, all over the United States, and in 160 nations of the world. 
powerful, far-reaching ministry and one we believe in. So we like to have them come every year. We support them not only once a year when we receive a special offering, but, you know, we send them money every month. This church sends them money every month. In fact, all the missionaries we support get a monthly check from this church. And, and we send that check to them whether the money comes in in our missions offering for them or not. It's, prior, it's a priority. And they count on it. Believe me, they count on it. Even though it may not be an enormous sum, yet they count on receiving it from us every month. And this church has been faithful in, in sending that support. If you recall, when Lucille was here, she said, you know, y'all are called faithful word for good reason because this church has been faithful to support me in all of these years. Some of these ministries and missionaries we have sent support to for 20, 30 years on a regular basis. Uh, sometimes we'll have a guest speaker, you know, like Harold Hunter who, who comes through, but, you know, He's a missionary as well, just right here in the United States, preaching the gospel all over. We've had Stephen Nicode, who's a, this man's like an apostle, like an apostle to the, the world, really. Ministries, missions that they send out, training, planting churches, which is an important part, by the way. Planting churches is an important part of reaching a nation. Amen. They, they, they needs to be a church there. That was that was God's idea. Brother Stephen Luke and his wife in, in uh, Central America and in Mexico. and uh, Brother Babu in India. Uh, Brother Koshi in India. Uh, Sister, Sister Lucille, we mentioned her in Mexico. Brother Clay Brooks and uh, Sister Mina, who was here last week. Uh, you know... I don't ever want our thought to be, as a church family, as a church body, I don't ever want our thought to be, oh, no, that's right, this Sunday we have a missionary coming. Uh, I think I'll just stay home this week. I think I'll just, yeah, you know, I'll just, I'm just going to do something else. It's just going to be another missionary. You know what I consider that? I consider that the, the misguided attitude of a spoiled child. How many of you could imagine telling your mother or your father, I'm not eating that. I will eat if you serve what I want. Any of you ever told your parents that when they put dinner on the table? You got two options. You take it or leave it. But really, it was only one option in my house. You eat it, and you be thankful. You be thankful for it. Even when it's something you're not too thrilled about eating, you're going to eat. And you will not complain. You will not complain. <laughs> But, you know, today, in today's world, children run the house, and uh, they don't want something, they'll let you know, and mom and daddy are only too, too quick to make sure that they get whatever it is that they want because they the boss. They the boss, they will whine and pout and whatever until they get their way. You're doing them no, no service by catering to their, to their appetites. You've got to let them know. It's not always about you, boy or daughter. You, you eat and you be thankful that you have food. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you may. Let's get you a microphone, though. Can we get our sister Faye a microphone? When the church secretary wants to speak, we let her speak. She doesn't do it very often. But, <laughs> but we will bring her the microphone. <laughs> No. Gwen will sabotage you if he can. I do write the checks for. I do write the checks for the uh, missions every every month and everything. But one of the things that I find uh, very important that a lot of people don't know is that when these missionaries go on the field, they don't have the opportunity 
to um, uh, make money if their support does not come in. They have, uh, you know, it's against the, a lot of the um, countries. They're there, and it's like, so if we don't support them, and if they, when they go in the field and they have X amount of dollars, you know, and they don't receive it, it's not like they can go and um, deliver pizza on the weekends to uh, make up the difference. You know, so it's like it's, it's very, very important that, you know, that the support that they have were promised they were, would receive. You know, and our church, as, as Brother Rusty said, has always been very, very faithful to uh, make sure that they get the support that we have promised them. And that really blesses me. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord that, that they do get a faithful support. Uh, you know, I've never been on the mission field as a missionary, so I, I can't personally... Uh, attest to this, but but I do know that missionaries talk to us, and they then they tell us, look, sometimes churches the, their support just stops coming, and sometimes sometimes it's you can blame it on the church, but sometimes you can't because sometimes churches go through a dynamic just like individuals do, right. you know, like a person could lose their job, right. a person could get transferred, a person could die. A, you know, there's reasons why people might might quit supporting the church and the, the church is unable to continue its support. I have seen that happen through the years in other places. Thankfully, it hasn't happened here. I was part of a church one time that had a major split. And when that happened, a lot of the big donors in the church were gone. And the church was committed to supporting certain missionaries that it, it could no longer support. And uh, those kind of things do happen. Sometimes churches change their vision, cha change their whole outlook. One of the biggest missionary churches in our state just decided that they weren't going to do that no more. That instead they were going to build churches across America and become, uh, I guess, a conglomerate. Or, and... And that's what they've done. Others have, uh, some of the big churches, some of the big churches, they don't support guys like you and me support. They have their own agendas, their own organizations that they put money into. Uh, so some of the people that we send money to, if, if the small churches, small like ours, and individuals don't send them money, it's like Sister Faye said, they... They struggle because it's, it's not like, you know, they're in a foreign country. They can go get a job. You can't do that. You, uh, you do without. Uh, so I, I do want us to know that it is important for us to faithfully support missions, missionaries, outreach. It's an important thing that we do uh, as a church. And the church has been generous in doing that over the past years. Last year, I, I, I mean, this year is not over, so I don't have any numbers for this year. But last year, I quickly looked at our, our last year's record. And between the outreach ministries of the church, which would be our, you know, basically radio and television, which we consider outreach, evangelism, and so forth, and our missionary support, this little church put almost $100,000 in missions and outreach. That's a lot of money from a congregation this size. And a significant part of the church's income, I might say, as well. <laughs> but what a blessing that, uh, that, that we are able to do that. I, I, I praise God for it, and I really believe that that's one of the reasons why the Lord blesses us. Because uh, we were also, years ago, many years ago, a part of a congregation that, that started, uh, it, it, it started, well, let's say it just it stopped supporting ministry, ministry outreaches uh, and missions. And because he, you can make an argument. That's a whole lot of money, Brother Rusty, to be sending to other places. Uh, the church could use that money 
But let me tell you what happens. The church will die. The church will wither and shrivel and die if it does not do what the Lord commanded us to do, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That we begin in, as the Lord said, look, it's going to begin right here in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is your own hometown, your own city. Uh, it, you begin in Jerusalem, but then from Jerusalem throughout Judea, all Judea. Judea, you could say, well, that's our whole state or our whole region. Uh, and even a larger area than that, you could say nationwide. And then the Lord said, and in Samaria. Now, remember, they didn't like the Samaritans as far as the nation of Israel. They didn't like the Samaritans, so... Here's the Lord's command. You, you don't bypass anybody. You don't overlook any people group, any nationality, any race, any ethnicity. The gospel is for everyone because Christ died for all. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then he said, and then the gospel is to go to the farthest regions of the world. The uttermost parts of the earth. We are commanded by Christ to preach the gospel to the whole world. Why we support missions? Because Christ commanded. Mark chapter 16, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every one, every person, all of mankind. That's not a suggestion, it's not an option. It's a command. Go ye. This is what the Lord said. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You know why we must do this and why the gospel must be preached? Because only the gospel can save. Men are perishing all over the world. Men, women, mankind. There's only one way to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's why... The gospel must be preached. The gospel must be preached. Right. It's not enough just, just to go like something Sister Mina said. I don't know if you all picked it up when she said it, but you know there are churches now in America sending missionaries who don't evangelize. Yeah. The missionaries they send don't preach the gospel. Yeah. They just send them out to be somebody's friend. And maybe to, to help them, to assist them, to, uh, but they don't preach the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our commission. That's our mission. If they don't hear the name of Jesus, there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. They must hear the gospel. The gospel says we are sinners. We are lost. We are undone and we are headed for an eternal hell unless we hear this good news that Christ died for our sins, that he took the penalty, he paid the price, he died in our stead if we will believe. If we believe the Bible... Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We believe that, then they need to hear the name of Jesus preached. And, and if they're going to hear the name of Jesus preached, that means somebody's got to go there and preach. And uh, you and I can't always go to every place in the world. But we can help those who do. Amen. We can support those who do. There are several things we can do. We can pray for them. We can give to support them. We can exhort and encourage them any way we can. And that's why, uh, that's why I think it's even a good idea if you not only tell these missionaries when they come that you, you, know, you, you appreciate them and you're praying for them, but encourage them if you can. You, you know, send them a note even. Send them a little note. Just a little note to let you know you're not out there all by yourself. We're praying for you back here. I, 
I think that would be tremendously appreciated by because they could they could be discouraged. It's got to be a difficult place to be. Joe and Betsy and uh, and the girls could tell us about it. Katie and Beth, because being out on a foreign country, away from you. Your church family and all, I would imagine it could be a discouraging place at times, difficult, uh, hardships, uh, maybe the funds don't come in, the food's not always very good, <laughs> weather's not always very good, Amen. and the note from home or a little package from home could go a long way, I think. Uh, we support missions because we believe the gospel, and because we must obey the commandment of the Lord, which is to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Here's a second reason why we support missions. How will the world know, how will they know about Jesus Christ, that he's the only way to be saved, the only name given under heaven whereby men must be saved? How will they know if nobody tells them? There's a passage in Romans chapter 10. You might want to work your way over there very quickly, and I'll read a couple of verses to you. Romans chapter 10. Y'all awake? I think it's important we talk about this. Romans chapter 10. Notice what verse 17 says. This is a familiar verse. So then faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the news? Uh, hearing the football scores? Hearing the fishing reports? No, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that actually generates faith. It generates faith in the human heart. Faith comes by hearing. But if you back up just a couple of verses, like to verse 13... Romans 10:13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If they call upon the name of the Lord, whosoever, red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor, educated, illiterate, no matter what part of the world they live in, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If they, no matter what kind of background, bondage, prison, no matter what, if they call upon the name of the Lord in true faith, Amen. they will be saved. But notice what he says in verse 14. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Remember, you have to believe. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How can they call upon him they've not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they've not heard? They never heard of Jesus. How, how can they call on Jesus? Mina said 80% of the Muslim world has never heard of the name of Jesus. They've never heard of him. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Unless somebody is telling them. How can they hear? And how can they preach unless they be sent? There's the missionaries. Amen. There's the ministries. There's the individuals that are out there proclaiming the word to the world. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How can they be saved if they don't hear? We can all participate in some way. You, you can't go to India. You can't go to Iran. You can't go to many of these countries. But you can pray for those who do go and who are there. And you can give something to help in their support. You can give financially. And you can encourage them. And when we have them come to the church uh, to tell us what God is doing in, in, in these countries, well, then you can say, ah, another missionary. I think I'm just going to stay home this week. Amen. 
we have to support missions. We have to be a missionary church. We have to sow. You know, it's a sacrifice to sow, to sow seed. It's a sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice God calls for us to make. And, and that brings me to a third reason why we support missions. We must support missions because the, the relationship between the church and missionaries is symbiotic. It's symbiotic, which means that we depend on each other. There is a mutual benefit when we support missions, foreign missionaries, at-home missions, and so forth. It was God's plan from the beginning that missions be supported by the church, by Christians, not by the heathen. You, you did bring your Bible, right? Yeah, yeah. I would like for you to turn with me to 3 John. We're going to look at a verse over here, 3 John. You know what 3 John is? It's right after 2 John, which is right after 1 John. And, and these little books, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, are just before Jude and Revelation. So it's all the way in the back of your Bible. But there's something here that I want us to read, something I want us to see, because it stands out to me, and, and I believe it will stand out to you as well. 3rd uh, John, John the aged apostle is writing to a brother in Christ who has been faithful in supporting missionaries, ministries, contributing to their need. And, and he reveals a little principle here that I, I think we should all grasp. Um, you know what, let me just begin in verse 1. As John, the aging apostle... He writes, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. My brother Gaius, he says, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as you walk in the truth. And I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And notice what he says beginning in verse 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity to, before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. You know what he was doing, Gaius, living where he was? He was, these itinerant ministries that passed through, because remember, a lot of traveling ministers in those days, traveling preachers, prophets, evangelists, teachers, a lot of traveling ministers, Gaius would support them. He would take them in. He would feed them. He would put them up. He would help them financially. And, and then when they were ready to leave, he'd send them on their way. But he took them in. Notice what he says. He says, you do well by bringing them forward on their journey. And they, they come to you, verse 7, for his name's sake. They're there in the name of Jesus, preaching the gospel of Christ. And notice, verse 7, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. It's not up to the Gentiles. That is the heathen, the unbelievers. It's not up to them to support missionaries. It's not up to them. It's up to you and me. Amen. And that's why he says, verse 8, we therefore ought. This is obligation. This is duty. We ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. You realize when they go on their missionary journeys, you help them, you support them, you are a fellow helper. You are laboring with them. They, 
the church's responsibility. That's the church's responsibility. I want to read the footnote in my Bible about verse 7, taking nothing of the Gentiles. It says, missionaries who leave their homes and go to other places to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ should refuse help from the unbelievers they're trying to win to Christ. To accept help from an unbeliever might hinder the gospel and expose the missionary to charges of preaching for financial gain. Therefore, missionaries should receive help from individual believers and from the church in contributing to the missionary endeavor of our church. We must remember the words of Christ. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. The, here's the promise. It's a symbiotic relationship. They benefit, we benefit. We bless them, God blesses us. That's, that's the way it works. And there are many passages in the Bible that reveal this relationship being symbiotic. And in Philippians chapter 4, Paul thanked the church in Philippi for standing firm and supporting him when other ministries failed to support him. Sometimes churches go through things and sometimes they just become negligent. Just like an individual, you know, we have, we got, well, we got this going on, we got that going on. I can't really give like a, you know, like a, maybe I should. Can I read something to you from the book of Philippians? You can turn there if you like, or you can just listen. But I, I do believe sometimes we need to be reminded of our responsibility. Amen. Not that... Uh, not that this church has failed, because you haven't. But in Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to read beginning in verse 10. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. He says, by the way, he's in jail at this time. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last, your care of me or your care for me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful or dutiful, but you lacked opportunity. Paul is saying, I'm thankful that you've thought about me. They sent him some support. That's what they did. They sent him some support. And he says, I'm thankful that <coughs> your care for me has flourished again. It's not that they forgot about Paul, apparently, but that for some reason there was a lapse in their giving for a while. But he's, he's very thankful that, that they are now able to resume their, their support. He says in verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want or lack, because I've learned in whatsoever state I am, whatever circumstance I'm in, I have learned right there to be content, to be content in that circumstance, whatever it is. Sometimes there are good days, good weeks, good months, good years, and then there are the lean years and the lean months sometimes. But look, here's what Paul said, I have learned. I'll be content. Whatever the Lord provides me with, I'm content right there. Because I know, verse 12, how to be abased, how to be low, how to be humbled. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed, I have learned how to be full, how to be hungry. I have been in all those situations. And, you know, I've been in places where I have abounded and in places where I have suffered lack. Am I cutting out? No? Okay. But notice, he says, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, life is about coping with our situation and our circumstances. We all have to learn to cope. Sometimes we have to make adjustments. 
Sometimes we have to tighten the belt. Sometimes we can let it out a notch or two. But we have to be, we have to realize things change in life. Things do change. We, we may have great times. We may have tough times. Can you praise God through it all? That's what Paul said. I can do all things through Christ. Whatever needs to be done, God helps me do it. Verse 14, he said, it's good of you to help me when I was having such a hard time, if you'll allow me to par paraphrase. I needed help. You stood up. You helped. You were a blessing. Notice what he says in verse 15. Now you Philippians also know that in the beginning of the gospel, when he first started going out, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. You guys were my only so source of support. No other church was, was helping. No, nobody else was contributing. You guys, you guys, I commend you. You only. And he says, verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again for my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Your giving, your giving produces fruit in your account. That's important for us to realize as well. But I have all in abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things that were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. You know, what you sent was an investment. It was a sacrifice, but it was an acceptable one to God. That's what he says. It was acceptable and well-pleasing to God. And it's in this context that we see verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We like verse 19, but sometimes we like to rip it out of its context. That when we offer a, a well-pleasing sacrifice to the Lord, look, the Lord will not fail to provide for us. The relationship is symbiotic. It's a mutual benefit, a mutual blessing. We bless, the Lord blesses. Amen. We sow, we reap. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And, and here's something else I'd like to point out that I think it's important for us to know. A fourth thing today, why we, why we must be a missionary church, why we must support missions. It is an eternal investment. It is an eternal investment. Don't think of it as a burden. Oh, no, another missionary. They're going to be looking for another offering. Don't think of it like that. Think of it as an opportunity to invest. An opportunity to invest and to make the best investment you can possibly make. Uh, consider... Matthew chapter 6, verses 19, 20, and 21. Here's what the Lord said. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth doesn't corrupt and where thieves can't break through and steal. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. How do you lay up treasures in heaven? How do you do that? This is how. This is how. You're right. This is how you do it. I came across something the other day. I want you to think about this. It was something about investing. I've never been good about investing in things like stocks and bonds and all that, so I just don't do it. I, 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 the only market I invest in is the supermarket. So, <laughs> Just because I don't know the market. Now, I, I did start investing in real estate many, many years ago, and let me tell you, it was wise. But I want you to listen to this. 
If you invested $3,000 in the 1980s, the 1980s, and that's a while back, but it's not too terribly long ago. In the 1980s, $3,000, you put 1000 in Apple, 1000 in Microsoft, and 1000 in in the M&T Bank. Uh, M&T is Manufacturers and Traders. It's this big, enormous bank in the Northeast, New York, all that area up there, you know, where the rich people are. If you invested a thousand in each of those in the 1980s, in 2016 you would have been worth 1.5 million. 1.5 million for a three thousand dollar investment. Now, here's the problem with that. First of all, you have no idea what stock is going to take off and going to provide you with that kind of a return. You have no idea. And you also know this, $3,000 in 1980 was a lot of money. I mean, it's still a significant amount, but 3000 in 1980? For you to invest 3000 in 1980 would have been a severe sacrifice, at least for many of you. Not for Bob. But, but for many, for many people, it would have been a severe sacrifice to invest that kind of money. Can I tell you this? All investment requires sacrifice. And all investment is long term. Real investments you have to consider long term. I mean, this is 1980, and now 1.5 million. If you cut some corners, you could probably get by 1.5 million. <laughs> Not be so extravagant with your lunch, you know, just right. cut a few corners. Well, I want you to know that sowing into the mission field yeah, is prime. You heard of blue chip stocks? Blue chip, these are the ones that are billion dollar plus stocks that have the record for stability and, you know, returns, well, there's no better stock than souls, than investing in the souls of mankind. This is, this is blue chip. It's an eternal investment that pays eternal dividends. And can I remind us of something that Sister Mina also said? America... You have been blessed for a reason. You've been blessed for a reason. And we are blessed. We are blessed. Blessed not, not only, as she said, to be able to gather and worship in public, not worried if people are following us to see where we meet so they can come arrest everybody not being able to sing very loud because we don't want the neighbors to know what we're doing over here because they'll call the police and they'll arrest us all. Can you imagine that every time you meet, you put your life in danger, and yet they meet anyway and, and can't wait to come together and do it, even though it could cost them their life? What a privilege we have to meet together without fear of arrest. And then we live in a very prosperous nation. In fact, we, we enjoy things that many other people in the world can't even imagine. We live in a level of prosperity. Even the least of us enjoys a level of prosperity unknown in many parts of the world. And can I also remind you that Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, to whom much is given, much is required. And let's remember that everything we have was given to us. We like to think, well, I'm an American. I earned every bit of it. Actually, it was given to you. It was given. The opportunities that you have was given to you. You think, yeah, well, I earned it with my own smarts. Well, can I tell you, that was given to you. Your ability, your talent, that was given to you. Everything you have was a gift. 
a gift that that you didn't deserve. But that you will be held accountable for because whatever you have have been gifted. Let's remember that you are only a steward of that gift. Amen. You are a steward. That means God will hold us accountable. And there will come a day when we will give an account for what we've done with what we have. You see, if what you had was really yours, you could keep it. But you can't keep what you've been given. That's right. Everything you have, you're going to leave behind. Because you can't keep it. There are things we can do with it. We can waste what we have. We can squander it on frivolous things or things that don't matter. You know, we can invest in the blue chip stocks of eternity. And we can help to fund missions in our own city, community, nation, and around our world. And this is what we are called to do. One last point I would like to make today, why we must continue to support missions. Because Jesus said the laborers are few. He said the harvest is white, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. When Jesus said that, you can imagine he lived in an agricultural society when fields being ripe with grain, vineyards being ripe with you know the fruit of the vine, ready to be picked, ready to be harvested. But imagine if there are no laborers to bring it in. What happens? It just spoils. It goes, it goes to waste. Well, the Lord used that as an illustration about reaching the nations of the world when he said, the harvest is plenteous. There's so many fields out there, so many fields, but the labor is a few. So pray for the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into the harvest. That's you and me, beloved. We can go. And those who can't go, we can support those who do. We can give. And our giving is a sacrifice. Yes, it is. It's an investment. All investment requires sacrifice. Years and years ago, Diane and I had uh, no money, (laughs) lots of kids and expenses and bills, but... But the Lord really put it on my heart, something my dad drilled in my mind many years ago. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because the, uh, I call him the old man who, who just died this past week. My dad told me, look, if you want to be smart, listen to Mr. Sal, because Mr. Sal was an investor. He invested in real estate. Sal was a barber. Barbers don't make a ton of money. But Sal saved, and he would buy a piece of real estate. And uh, even when he bought his own house, when he bought his own house, he bought a double. So he could live in half, rent the other half. He was a wise investor. He died this past week, and he probably was worth $20 million. A barber. That's quite an accumulation. But Sal used to tell me, because we would fish together. He was my dad's business partner. Him and him, they, were cut, they used to cut hair together in the 50s and, and 60s. And then Mr. Sal used to tell me, Rusty, you better, you better put some money into something because, you know, you're going to grow older. And uh, as much as your church loves you, what happens if they can no longer support you? What happens if you can't what happens if you can't preach anymore and they have to get another preacher? They got to support that preacher. What happens to you? Bye-bye. Well, <laughs> I 
That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So we sacrificed. Years ago, when we didn't really have it to do, we sacrificed and we bought a, a double just to rent it. Yeah. And now here we are, not even a fraction of what Mr. Sow had. <laughs> He's uh, 30 years later. But I'll tell you, it was a wise investment. Oh, yeah. And from that, you know, we, we did a few more. And uh, right. Thank you, Lord. one day I'll tell you all that story. But right. for now, uh, what I want you to know is that there is no greater investment. If buying real estate here is a good, sound investment, it's not always that, but, by the way. But if it is, just think about, wow. just think about investing in eternity. Wow. Laying up treasures in heaven, wow. you can only do that by supporting those who are doing what the Lord said we should do. Let's, let's be a blessing to those who are, who are out there doing it. The Lord said, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And that every man would receive his own reward from his own labor. So, you know, we, labor, we are all laborers together. With Christ. I also want you to know, just by way of passing, that uh, when ministries, missionaries, evangelists, guest speakers come, they may say things that make you scratch your head a little bit. Right. Maybe they'll say things that aren't 100% kosher. They may say things that uh, you'd say, well, that's not what Brother Rusty said. <laughs> Sometimes you do have to clean up after them, no matter who the guest speaker is. But, uh, you know, you bring people from outside, you know. Here's what I want you to know. Let me, let me get to it. Missionaries on the foreign field do not all have the teaching, training, uh, that you, that you have been blessed to have. Many of them do not have a, a, a deep theological background. And I've also come to realize that many of them, uh, when they do get to learn things, hear things, read things, it's often from ministries that send them stuff. And that happens to usually be the big, gigantic, ministries in America, uh, the ones that we don't really endorse very much. But those folks send their stuff all over the world, and, it, and I've also noticed through the years that it does influence sometimes the missionaries. For better or worse, sometimes it does influence them. I, I say this to you because... We want to be understanding yeah, right. and, uh, and not jump on their case. Right. Uh, if we don't want to overlook error, no. to be sure, Never. but when these folks, if, you know, if we made them pass a, a theological test, if we made everybody pass a theological test and dot their I's and cross their T's like we do, we wouldn't have anybody here. <laughs> Y'all might not even let me speak. But we just have to, we have to be understanding that Amen. their understanding, they haven't had the privilege where they are of, of, of in-depth biblical teaching. That's just a fact. That's, right. It's just a fact. Amen. But, so we'll be understanding, we'll pray, yes. we'll give. Our missions giving is in addition to what we do in supporting our local church, because if we don't support the local church, there won't be any nope. uh, local church. Right. But it's all in, it, it all works hand in hand. Yes. I do want to commend you for being generous, you, for unselfishly giving. I want to thank you for serving, for your willingness to be a, to be just a servant of the Lord. Amen. I. I I want to thank you for your willingness to sow into the mission fields of the world uh, and to support these ministries and missionaries. And, and I do believe God has blessed this church for it. Yes. 
and that he's blessed you for it Amen. and that he will continue to do so yes. as we give you, as as we've been blessed Amen. we can all do something yes. Thank you, Lord. some can give more some can give less some like bob can really pour it in <laughs> others of us will do what we can right So, that's why we support missions. Father, we do pray that you will, that you will continue to bless this body and this congregation with the ability to sow into the harvest fields of the world. I thank you, Lord, for their generosity. I ask you, Lord, to increase them and cause them to abound. You promise to provide seed for the sower. And Lord, Continue to do that, we pray. Provide seed for the sower. Lord, for all the nations of the world that need the gospel, we pray for them all, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, for the laborers in their midst. We pray, Lord, that you give us give us an understanding heart, a compassionate heart, and a heart willing to sacrifice Lord, we pray for our own country. We pray, Lord, for its leadership. We pray, Lord, that you help us to, to, to be able to maintain our religious freedoms and liberties. And, Lord, we ask that you prevent anything from infringing upon those liberties. We ask this. We ask for this mercy, Lord, for our country. Lord, we... Ask your continued blessing upon each and every one of us. Those who need, bless. Those who have lack, provide, we pray. Those sick, heal, Lord, we ask. Lord, we also pray for that little sliver of land over there in the Middle East, Lord, that you've written your name upon. We pray for its peace, the peace of Jerusalem, your protection upon the nation of Israel, and for its salvation. And for the salvation of Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and pagans and unbelievers all across our world. And I pray, Lord, that you will use us, you will use us as missionaries in our Jerusalem and in our Judea. Not leaving anyone out throughout the Samarias of the world and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. The Lord is good to us.